In this interview, we're talking about Arlington National Cemetery, more specifically, Section 27. This is Twitter. Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I'm your host, Frederick Van Johnson. In this episode, I have the honor of speaking with Mr. Michael McCoy. He is a photojournalist, photographer, image maker, those sorts of people. And we're going to be talking about uh, a project that he recently worked on in Section 27 at Arlington National Cemetery. We're going to talk about that, plus a, a, a couple of other interesting things in and around how a photojournalist operates in the city of D.C. Mike McCoy, how you doing, man? How's it going? Hey, what's going on, man? It's, hey, it's great to be here. It is good to have you, man. First of all, thank you for all the effort. I know we've been uh, we've been chatting back and forth, and we you are the one of the busiest, hardest working photojournalists <laughs> in the city, and we finally managed to nail oh, you down wow. and get you in a coffee shop between assignments. So, <laughs> so I appreciate I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to do this, man. I'm just I'm just happy to be here with you, man. Yeah, no, this is good. We got a lot of we got a lot of good stuff to talk about. So let let's start. Let's kick it off with um, just a little bit of background on you. So you you are a photographer. You know, you shoot with Fuji cameras, obviously. You part of the, this uh, the, this project that we're working on. But and we're going to dive into the Section Twenty Seven stuff. But give us a little background on who Mike McCoy is and how you got started in this whole gig of clicking shutters and making money. Um, well, everyone knows um, I'm Mike McCoy. I'm born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland. And um, as a kid, I would play around with my father's film camera that he kept in the car. And um, as I got older, you know, you start meeting girls and kind of put the camera down. But it really wasn't <laughs> until I got to Iraq, I would always take photographs and I would send them back home to my mother just to let her know that I was safe. And um, it kind of grew on me a little bit. But, you know, after losing my mother when I was in Iraq and um, a few other family members, I realized you can't get that time back. So you can't catch up on all of the partying, you know, all of the girls. So, you know, why not just document things? Yeah. And um, <clears throat> and, and here I am today. I love that, man. Yeah, that's that's good. I, that's the first time I heard somebody position it like that. That's true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but think about it. I mean, you, you, you can't catch up. Yeah. You know, time is the one thing that you cannot get back. You can have all of the money in the world. You can have all of the jewelry. You can have all of the women. You can have all of the, the cars. But you can't have all of the time. And, you know, yeah. once that moment's gone, it's gone. And, you know, and that's why this camera to, you know, capture those important moments. Yeah. No, for real. No, no. Speaking of the cameras, like I mentioned in the beginning of this, this is part of this, this Fujifilm uh, visual momentum series that we're putting together. Why why did you choose Fuji? What was your, your path to choosing Fuji over, you know, any of the other brands out there? Um, you know, I was a Nikon shooter at one time and uh there's nothing wrong with Nikon, but I just love Fuji. You know, I just love its small, uh compact size, um, the quiet shutter. You know, depending on which camera you're using, like if you're using like the X one hundred series, you know, that, that thing can be like totally silent. Mm -hmm. You know, versus some of your, you know, bigger cameras, you know, they're going to make a noise. Um, I'll give you an example. I was shooting a funeral one day and, you know, thankfully for the Fuji, I was able to shoot that funeral, you know, capture those images without being a distraction to a grieving family. Yeah. And with cameras like your Nikons and your um, Canons and some of the other DSLRs, you just don't have that flexibility. And, you know, that's one great thing I like about Fuji, other than it's amazing colors. And you, yeah, that's the, that's one of the things I hear about all the time is the, the, the Fuji look and the Fuji color palette and the way it renders um, color. But one of the other things I want to talk to you about, since I have a, a D.C.-based photographer, you are you shoot a lot of political stuff, I would imagine, out there, right? So I do. Does, does the silent shutter ever factor into that? Like you're in, like in a deposition or some sort of, you know impeachment hearing or something and you gotta be <laughs> you gotta be silent about it does that does it factor in there now i haven't we i haven't been to the impeachment hearings yet but yeah. once i do go i'm definitely going to test that out again <laughs> but um <laughs> but you know on the hill you know the majority of the, the the guys on the hill they're shooting dslrs and some guys have migrated to mirrorless you know some are using they're using more fuji 
maybe the Nikon Z series and, and Canon's um, uh, mirrorless camera, and occasionally Sony. So you don't really find like a lot of Fuji shooters on the hill, uh, besides myself and I think um, one other guy. But <clears throat> it, it really doesn't matter. But um, it's just whatever works for you, right? I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, you yeah. find it's like it's just like we talk about. It. It's like life. You don't get time back, and and the minutes you do spend on the planet. Why not shoot with something that you like versus right. something that something you know, something that you love? Yeah, something you know, that like, you love. Yeah, I, I, I love it, man. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I hear from Fuji shooters all the time. Really, okay. So let, let's switch gears. I want to talk about this okay. the, the project uh, section twenty seven. So for the folks that may not know, um, tell us about first of all. Let's let's start at the top. Tell us what Arlington National Cemetery is for the folks outside the country that may not understand the significance of, uh, of that place and then we'll dive into one section inside Arlington okay well for those who don't know Arlington Cemetery is one of the country's largest military cemeteries and um, it's home to uh, lots of uh, veterans and, and their families and it's also the home of JFK um, Joe Lewis Mega Evers um who else is buried there? Uh, William, sorry, uh, James Chappie. He mm -hmm. was the Air Force's first four-star general of color. Wow. And um, But then we also have Section 27. And yeah. uh, many people aren't aware of Section 27 because no one ever talks about it. You know, if you go to the cemetery and you look into one of their programs, you may see something there in, in, in very small print, but... No one ever goes into the history of 27, even if you were to take a, a guided tour through the cemetery. You know, the, the tour guys and the bus drivers, they talk about every other part of the cemetery except 27. All right, so I, mean, I, I don't know why they don't talk about 27. Maybe the bus drivers, the tour guys aren't trained. Maybe they choose not to talk about it. But, you know, me as the photographer, it's my job and it's my duty to talk about those stories that often don't get told. Yeah. And um, like for instance, you know, William H. Christmas, Christman, I'm sorry. He was the first person buried at Arlington Cemetery and he was a black man. Wow. And he was the first he, one buried there in the whole first, place. Yes. Yes, wow. sir. Okay. And, and, and many people don't know that. Wow. You know? So is it so so the, the section 27, it's a it's a section where it's, it's primarily, if not all black people or people of color. Right. That are in that that are buried and laid to rest in that section. And like you said, it's notable names that are that are in there. But part of the issue that you wanted to draw, shine a light on was the fact that tours, et cetera, just kind of blow right by that. Why do you think that is? Why are people just like why are why are the historians and tour guides, et cetera, talking about the significance of Section 27? You know, like your guess is good as mine. You know, I, I don't know what those guys are thinking or. Or, or their reasoning, you know, for not talking about it. You know, I wish they would talk about it, but um, until they do, I mean, I, I hope that this story and this platform here could um, educate more people about the importance of Second 27 and um, hopefully spark some conversations. Yeah, yeah. Well, tell me, let's dive into the project itself. So this wasn't a, like a day. It wasn't like a day you just decided to go out there and take some pictures. This happened over a period of time. Take me take me through the project itself and and how you came up with the idea and what was the, cause you know, as, as a photojournalist, as a photographer, you get an idea and you have to go do it. So right. from that point all the way through to you ready to show people, what was that process? Like? Well, you know, I would go to the cemetery, um, several times a year. I would go on like veterans day, uh, Memorial day and Christmas. So for veterans day, Memorial day, uh, the soldiers lay, flags on all of the, uh, the the graves and for Christmas they lay wreaths and um, one thing I noticed no one really knew about 27 you know like you would have young soldiers that were assigned to the old guard which is the army unit that maintains the cemetery and um, I would have black soldiers and they would not know that the section that they were standing in is you know it was the burial ground for black soldiers who paved the way for soldiers like myself and, and those soldiers, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, 
I just started noticing, and I would just go back occasionally just to look around, and, like, you wouldn't see anything. And uh, it was, I want to say it was, was it last year, um, President Trump decided to go to the cemetery for Memorial Day, and I noticed the mass of the people went over to section, uh, I forgot the section where the, the tomb is, but they went over to the tomb and I know soldier. And uh, section 27, I think I may have encountered like six people that entire day. Uh, I met a couple from North Carolina who knew about 27. But then there were, uh, I want to say, four uh, staff members of the cemetery. It was, I want to say, like three security guards that work for the cemetery and like maybe one or two military police officers. Then they were all people of color. So that day, the only people that I saw on that side of the cemetery were black people and they were working. Mm. And, um, I mean, it was it was like a big history lesson because the security guards knew what they were guarding, but the young African American active duty soldier, he didn't know. Yeah. But once I told him, you know, he was he was amazed, and um, I could see like the honor and, and the dignity that he had once he knew what he was guarding right there. So, you know, I wonder if you haven't hit on something that's that is a is a longer project than maybe just Section Twenty Seven because. You, you and I both know that the White House itself was built by slaves, right? And oh, yeah. the Washington Monument and, you know, a lot of the, the bedrock. Capitol. The Capitol, yeah. The, a lot of the Hell, bedrock the whole, the, that is the Washington. World. Yeah, the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so maybe that's a bigger story, you know? Have you considered expanding out and telling that story as well about, you know, black people and their contribution to, you know, starting with the nation's capital? Um, it's, it's crossed my mind, mm -hmm. but, um, in order to do stuff like this, I'm going to have to have funding and, um, as a freelance photojournalist, you know, my, I, I love to do passionate work that tells great stories, but, um, without funding, it makes those, um, projects, uh, near impossible. Yeah. Too yeah. Great. You want to you want to you want to tell do passionate work, but you also have a habit of eating, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. Get a cup of coffee every now and then. You know? <laughs> exactly. I know. I got the same problem, man. I'm addicted to food, <laughs> water, and shelter. I don't know how to break the habit. <laughs> and Wi Fi. <laughs> oh yeah. So I want to, you know, on that that same token, I wanted to talk about um, just uh, like a day in the life or the the life in a black photojournalist world in a city like dc which has its share of drama and you know being the nation's capital or, or not it has its share of drama of violence and you know you got your politics you got your violence and this is just me on the on the west coast looking in i can't imagine what it's like being on the inside of it can you tell, tell us what a day in the life for for mike mccoy looks like i had imagine uh -huh. you're just like running around and you know oh something happened over there i gotta be over there okay now there's a hearing i gotta go over there you know how does it work uh, it all depends i mean a, a normal day on the hill um hearing stakeouts um briefings um <clears throat> A, a normal day for me, which a lot of people don't see, and you, you may see it if you watch C-SPAN or if you're watching maybe CNN, they may show those kind of shots, but um, normally you're like the only person of color. Um, it's a male-dominated uh, industry. You, you may find some females, but for the most part, you find um, white male photojournalists and... Um, and how do they how do they treat you? I mean, is it do you do you feel like it's just you know we're all photographers, we're all trying to get this get the shot, or do you feel like there's a why is he here kind of syndrome going on? Um, I don't want to say is why is he here, but one thing that I do notice, you know, in the beginning, you know, like very few people would uh, talk to me, and um, even to this day, I mean, everyone knows who I am. Uh, we speak, but there's only maybe two or three out of, I don't know how many, you know, journals on the Hill that would actually sit there and, you know, have a conversation, or even have lunch with me. 
Wow. Wow. Really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So you know, I wanted the. I mean, we could talk about this this topic for for hours. The Arlington topic and and being a photographer in D.C. But I'm curious. Are there are there any on the on the 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 Section 27 side of things? Are there any sort of uh, stories that pop out of your head, uh, you know, that are just like, okay, this, whenever you think of that, whenever you think of section 27, you think of this particular shot for a reason or any things like that that come into mind? Uh, when I think of section 27, I just think about all of the people who paved the way for, you know, people like myself and you, you know, yeah. we're both vets and uh, without the contributions of our uh, fellow African-American soldiers who served before us, we wouldn't have the same liberties that we have now. Hell, we wouldn't be here doing this podcast. Right. So when I when I think of 27, I think about a lot of these brave brothers and sisters who served and did heroic things. And a lot of people don't know, but Section 27 is also um, the home of I don't don't misquote me, but I want to say like maybe four or five uh, recipients of the Medal of Honor. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So I mean, that's that's what I think about when I think of 27. Yeah. So I think one of the takeaways from this interview is next time you you find yourself in D.C. and you're contemplating the different tourist places you're going to go, put Section 27 on the map along with the White House. And when you go to the White House, raise your hand and say, you know, who built this place? (laughs) Where'd you guys get all that labor to build this place? It's amazing. You know, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So what's coming up next for Mike McCoy? What's on What's on your radar? Um. start this uh, new project tomorrow um, it's going to be really 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 major um, hopefully I can talk a little more about it uh, oh a secret in a couple of oh. weeks. Uh, I don't want to say a secret but I mean like your entire like base will have to sign an NDA <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that would make a secret <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah but, no um, that's cool how long is that project now because you were you were, when we were talking offline you were saying you were working on something that's going to be like 10 hours a day for a while right yeah so i'm, I'm going to be doing this tomorrow up until wednesday 10 hours a day i'm going to be like freaking tired yeah yeah well, that's good i mean it's better it's better to be tired of that than, than tired of sitting at home waiting on the phone I, to ring right? i know right yeah <laughs> That's yeah, cool. That's cool. So you gonna so these all these jobs, you know. I know that the this week in photo audience is always curious about gear and post processing and all that stuff. So take us through the kit that you that you're gonna like on this next job you're gonna do. Take us through the kit that you're gonna take there, and then what does the the post processing of that job look like? Do you send whomever raw files, or do you send them processed JPEGs, or what does it look like? Well. But this job here, I mean, everything's all Fuji. So, like, my day-to-day, you know, I generally carry my um, Fuji X-T2 or 3, um, my H1, a 16-55, to 55, a 50-140. to 140. Um, That's just, like, walk-around gear for the hill. Um, I may go with a fixed lens every now and then, depending on what I'm doing. But for most stuff on the hill, you may not always have access to moving around freely, so you always want to have some type of, you know, flexibility set up while I use the zoom lens. But I'm um, also keep a 23 f2, a 35 one4 and a 50 f2 in the bag because you never know when you're going to need it. But then um, every now and then, I may break out the 200 f2, and um, those or like some really 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 you can make some really tight portraits with those uh that long lens yeah but you know for this job here i'm pretty much going to have that same setup minus the um 200 but i'm also going to be using the gfx uh 50s which i'm very very excited to use so um i actually picked that up this morning and um, i went home and i programmed it to uh, mirror my other cameras and uh, I, ju- I just can't wait to um, play around with it. Hopefully, after this interview, um, I can go out and take some test shots. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Have, have you have you seen that? I know we're, we're photographer nerding out now. Um, <laughs> have you have you seen that 100 megapixel Fuji camera? I, I haven't uh, had a chance to like hold it in my hand, but I, I hear like lots of good things about it. Yeah, well, you would. Uh, you, would you ever consider using something like that in photojournalism, or is it more of a just a studio portrait camera? Um, it depends. Um, you, you know, you have guys like David uh, Berto, or Berto, and um, he's a photojournalist, and he does a lot of work for Time, and he does a lot of work for uh, Redux, and he has a very, very unique style. 
and he shoots a lot uh, with like the Leica M series, and occasionally he'll use a uh, media format camera. So I can see myself doing something like that. Yeah, nice, interesting. Well, but, keep us posted. I'm I'm, right. I'm curious to see what you what how your how that bag evolves and all that stuff. I mean, Fuji and mirrorless cameras in general are light, right? But yeah. you got a lot of stuff in your bag. I can <laughs> so, and you know. a computer and uh, a com- <laughs> like ten batteries, computer, chargers, headphones. Wow, wow. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it at this. I had a, I heard a rumor, uh, and you tell me if this is true or not. Have you you you've been inside the White House shooting, right? Uh, I have not. Oh, you haven't been in there. Nah, so have nah. you heard this rumor? I heard a rumor that the the press corps that goes into the White House. I don't I don't know if they're doing that anymore, but but they used to have to line up outside and wait for them to let them in, and it was kind of a it was a, a first come first serve basis. And this photojournalist was telling me. Um, that you, they would have to, some of them would just wear adult diapers and stand in line so that they could just, you know, let's say be comfortable without having to make a beeline to Starbucks or something. Did you, wow. did you ever hear anything like that? Uh, I haven't, man, but uh, I don't doubt it. Yeah, you, you, that's a good idea, isn't it? You're going to go get some of those, right? Yeah. <laughs> Depends. <laughs> They're not going to have too much weight in my bag. Hopefully not. <laughs> exactly. At least not at the beginning of the day. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> awesome. All right, Mike McCoy. If people, if people want to follow your work and check out your shots, and during this interview, I'll have overlaid some shots in Section 27, and in the blog post uh, where this is embedded, there'll be a photo gallery so they can see those shots. But if they want to see other work that you've done or like this this gig that you're going to be starting shortly, where should they go check your stuff out at? Um, they can check out my website as www.michaelamccoy, all one word, uh, photography.com. Or you can check out my Instagram page. It's Michael A. McCoy Photography. And my Twitter is Mike McCoy Photo. Perfect. And uh, you can always catch catch me on there. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to you know shoot me a message. Awesome. Yeah. And I'll uh, I'll put all those those will if if I do my job right those will have been on the screen during the interview, <laughs> and and they'll be in the blog post and in the YouTube description as well. So you know you won't be hard to find. Uh, Mike McCoy, thank you so much for for taking the time to do this and all the effort. Uh, I know putting putting these interviews together, especially with busy working photojournalists, is not easy. And you're one of the busier ones, right? And you are. So it was. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this interview. Well, I mean, thank you for having me, man. Like, I'm a big fan of your show, and I'm just happy that I that you, that you guys thought that much of me to like have me on. Awesome. No, of course. The honor, the honor is all ours. So trust me. <laughs> all right, man. You you enjoy the rest of your day and uh, and stay in touch. Keep us posted. I I want to have you on again when you uh, when you finish that other project because I'm now I'm curious. I want to hear about it. <laughs> Absolutely, man. I right. definitely look forward to coming back. Yep. Yeah. No, you're in the family now. So just just let us know when you're ready to come back anytime. Anytime. All right, no Mike problem. McCoy, photojournalist, Washington D.C., Section 27. Take care, man. Thank you. Peace. This is Twitter.